Hello everyone, it's History Behind the Warrior, and as always, welcome back to another History of Video. Today, voted by all of you in the recent character pool I put up. And it looks like even in death, we can't get away from the old head of the Mishima Zaibotsu, the conqueror and wielder of the electric wind godfist, Heihachi Mishima. Now Heihachi is truly an iconic face in the franchise, with a wide array of enemies from his own heinous acts. And you know what? We all love him for that. Having made his very first appearance in the original Tekken, Heihachi really paved a legacy for many future generations, both out and in this game through Kazuya, Lars, and of course, most recently, Reina. The blood of this one Mishima helped shape the series. And what's even more crazy is that although he did not have the devil gene, Heihachi, historically, is easily one of the strongest characters this franchise has ever produced. But with that said, how did he get to be where he is? How did he shape the Mishima line into what it is now? Well, that is what we will be exploring in this video. Now, just before we do get the ball rolling, I do want to note that the broad scope of Heihachi's villainy is one that's so far and so wide that it dips into most characters' plots and pursuits. So because of this, I will be strictly streamlining his story, as it's my main prerogative to tell a story from his perspective that is also cohesive and cuts away any excess fluff that could bog this video down. But as always, just as we kick things off, if you like what we do here and wish to see more, please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up as it does go a very long way here. And if you wish to stay up to date with everything we do here, please don't forget to subscribe as well as tick that bell. Anywho, let's just jump right into things. Now Heihachi derives from a very ancient dynasty of Japanese warriors. The Mishimas. They themselves originated from the Haina period and were known to be ferocious fighters. Yet, they wouldn't find true generational success until the events of World War II, as they capitalized off the war through weapons of mass destruction, inevitably leading to the creation of the Mishima Zaibotsu, formed and owned by Heihachi's father, Jinpachi Mishima. At some point following the war, Jinpachi began to distance himself from their past, instead turning their gaze towards martial arts and forging a new legacy for his line, crafting and perfecting the Mishima style of karate. So, not long after this, Heihachi would be born. And growing up, very, very little is known of his early years. We at no point actually ever hear or see what became of his mother. All that we do know is that he was raised in Mishima-style karate, seeding a strong lust for power and respect. In fact, so much so, that at a very young age, his ambitions laid down the foundation for what would come next. These urges would alarm Jinpachi, as he seek to suppress it, yet it would never truly die. This would go on to sow resentment between the two, especially as Heihachi grew older, seeing his father's kindness as weakness. In time though, such desire would be quelled, as once the dojo was blessed with another student, Kazumi Hachijo, he would be swept off his feet by her beauty, and a romance would blossom between the two as they trained together. This would later flourish into a marriage, and eventually they sired a child, Kazuya. So for a time, Heihachi was quite content with life. Although he saw Kazuya as quite a disappointment, he was happy. And even then, that wasn't enough for him. Although his family life thrived, his hunger for power clouded his comfort, lusting for more than just simplicities. Heihachi would organize a coup to overthrow his father, becoming the new head of the Zaibotsu. Knowing full well that Jinpachi would strike back, in a cruel sequence of events, he would take his father and imprison him beneath their family dojo, leaving Jinpachi to starve to death and die alone. So Heihachi reigned supreme. Naturally, such betrayal caused quite an uproar, but none more so than his wife Kazumi, who would later attack Heihachi 
for his transgression. To add an extra layer of tragedy to this all, whilst Heihachi deeply loved Kazumi with all of his heart, he never actually knew the true purpose of her arrival at their dojo. Kazumi was merely a plant by the ancient Hachijo line, a family of guardians designated to eliminate threats of a global scale. So whilst their love had been true, this was all merely part of the plan. The family was designed to deter him from this path. So Heihachi, falling back into his old ways, actually forced her hand. And much to his horror, not only did she reveal her true colours to him, but also her devil form. The very first time, he gazed upon a being with such power. Forced into a do or die situation, it is with a broken heart that Heihachi is forced to kill his wife breaking her neck, and sewing wounds that would never truly heal. Going forward, Heihachi is actually haunted by her transformation, beginning to wonder if his own son was struck with such an infliction. So upon returning back home and telling him of Kazumi's demise, the young five-year-old Kazuya would be struck unconscious and then tossed off a cliff. Whilst senselessly brutal, he did have the belief that should Kazuya survive, then he knew that his son was no ordinary boy. And you know what? He was right, as the drop itself had awoken Kazuya's dormant devil gene. From here, a long, deep-seated hatred festered between the two, as Heihachi antagonized his son at every opportunity possible, even adopting a young street urchin from China, Li Chaolong, just so he could have someone contest Kazuya's inheritance. I mean, hell, he even adopted a bear and taught it karate, just to show you how petty this man is. As this went on, Heihachi did have other suspicions and worries. More specifically, if he himself was tainted by the devil gene. Thus, moving forward and throughout the series, Heihachi would actually go on to sire 18 to 25 different children just to see if they had the devil gene. And in nearly all instances, he was in the clear. Of course, now though, we do know that there is one that did slip through his grasps. Returning back to business, Heihachi would breathe ruthless life into that of the Zaibotsu manipulating gangs, controlling authorities, and stealing whatever he desired from whomever he wished. He was nigh unstoppable, but with such power required the best of protection. Wishing to create the perfect militant force, he came up with a genius idea to create a martial arts tournament that would bring in talent across the world, recruiting those that entered beneath him. And such a tournament deserved such a fitting name, the King of the Iron Fist. The thing is though, Heihachi had gone in with such confidence in his skill that he even offered to participate and put ownership of the Mishima Zaibotsu on the line, taking us on to the events of Tekken 1. And whilst we don't know the finer details of the bracket or who fought who, we do know that both Kazuya and Lee would participate, with Kazuya victorious defeating his father. And having not forgotten what he had done to him, Kazuya would drop him off a cliff, sending him to a bitter end. So from this point onwards, the Mishima Zaibotsu is under his control. Moving on to Tekken 2, Heihachi is completely stripped bare of his funding, his power, and his wealth. Angered at himself and the complacency he had shown, Heihachi would travel deep into the mountains to refine his combat, to sharpen his mind and channel the power through his fists. It's all he did every day, as the only friend he had during this time was Kuma. On the Kazuya front, with him now in control of the Zaibotsu, Heihachi knew it was only a matter of time before his son organized his own tournament. Knowing that with his dark reign, he required a display of power, so he would bind his time and enter much to the surprise of all. He crushed his competition, even defeating Kazuya in his devil form, having taken back what he had once lost. This time though, to guarantee that Kazuya would not return, Heihachi wouldn't settle for dropping him off a cliff, but instead that of a volcano. 
leading to the seeming demise of his son. Now, following this point, a lot does happen between the events of Tekken 2 to 3, as more than a decade and a half would pass between these games. So, from a family perspective, after Kazuya's fall, Heihachi would actually disown Lee, as he found out that he had been Kazuya's secretary. So feeling betrayed, Heihachi would cut him out from their bloodline and completely forbid him from ever entering his competition. Along with this, unfortunately, Kuma would pass on, but in turn, leave a young cub for Heihachi to raise. So it wasn't entirely bleak during this time period. From a business perspective, the Zaibatsu was thriving. Under his leadership, it was growing with more and more power, as public stunts were performed to frame it in a positive light. This eventually led to the creation of the Tekken Force, his own private military faction whom he appointed at facilities. As during this time, he had also grown a strong interest in human experimentation, as there was one being that caught his attention, the primordial god of fighting, Ogre. The beast would lay siege to his Tekken Force, leaving chaos wherever it walked. And whilst others saw devastation, Heihachi saw power, believing his DNA to be the perfect one to graft onto his own. So moving forward, Heihachi kept a very close eye on Ogre, as he was at the time hunting some of the world's strongest fighters. Now this wasn't the only surprise at his doorstep, as one day, a very young man by the name of Jin Kazama would appear before him claiming that he was his grandson and child of Kazuya and Jun. Admittedly, he was a bit taken back, as he was all too familiar with the devil blood, yet he couldn't deny the potential that lingered in Kazuya's son. And with Ogre seeking strong fighters, he sought to train Jin to draw him out. So over the course of the next few years, he would vigorously beat and train Jin into the best shape of his life, tutoring him in Mishima-style karate as they prepared for the next tournament. So now, during the events of Tekken 3, Heihachi plays more of a mediator role than someone that is actively competing, as he's merely waiting for the appearance of Ogre, and he does get his wish in the grand finals as the beast would be vanquished by his grandson. And with no further use for Jin, he would look to tie up loose ends, gunning him down and wishing to take their remains. This betrayal, though, would not go unpunished, as he had unintentionally awoken Jin's devil gene, leading to a swift dismantling of his Tekken force and slamming Heihachi through a wall, soaring off into the night sky, free. In the aftermath of these events, Heihachi would lay claim to what remained of Ogre, but despite his dreams, his DNA was incompatible. Frustrated, he does eventually turn towards the Devil Gene, looking to weaponize it and create devil-human hybrids. Knowing that the biofirm company, G Corporation, also shared that very same interest, he would dispatch a Tekken force to retrieve all of their information. But once inside, there was one person they never had accounted for. The return of Kazuya. Revived by G Corporation, he would annihilate the Tekken Force and address Heihachi directly, saying that he was coming for everything. Naturally, this got quite a rise out of him, yet his key mind saw opportunity here. With Jin on the run and Kazuya seeking revenge, he would announce the fourth King of Iron Fist to draw them out to take them to Honmaru, which now brings us into Tekken 4. During this installment, nearly everything goes as planned. He draws out his kin, captures Jin, and defeats Kazuya in the grand finals. But instead of rendering him unconscious, Heihachi would take him to Honmaru Dojo and watch them all be imprisoned like Jinpachi. His excitement and over-eager mind though is what does ultimately catch up to him as Jin is able to break free of his shackles and does nearly kill the two, showing them mercy at the last second. But upon Jin's escape, the dojo is then attacked by G Corporation. Having betrayed Kazuya, 
in the hopes of killing two birds with one stone. With no other choice, the two sides band together and annihilate the Jax units. That is, until Kazuya sees a window of opportunity. Grabbing Heihachi, he would toss him at the Jax and have him be pinned down as they explode, decimating the temple and leaving him in a critical condition. So during the events of Tekken 5, canonically, he's basically sidelined for the entire game. As when he awakens, the tournament is over, and the Zaibotsu is in ownership of Jin. As we come into Tekken 6, this is where things get very, very interesting. As being stripped of the Zaibotsu once more, Heihachi is forced to rebuild his life again, recruiting whatever remained of his Tekken force that remained loyal to him. Initially, Heihachi bared some interest in regaining his power, but with Jin in charge, there was no chance of that happening. So he now lived his days in hiding, waiting for his moments. And one day, he would be found by a very unexpected visitor, and someone he hadn't seen in decades. Lars Alexanderson, his illegitimate child who had been looking for answers. Having suffered amnesia during this time, and the second he laid his eyes on Heihachi, memories and anger instantly flooded back. Furious to meet him, Lars would fire at Heihachi, only for the old man to catch the bullet between his teeth. At this point, nothing much more needed to be said, and the two part ways. Now coming into Tekken 7, Heihachi would return back to power, as Jin had fallen during the end of 6. So with his disappearance, the seat of power was open, with him looking to restore the Zaibotsu back to its former glory, recruiting Nino Williams in the process. And to celebrate his return, he would announce another Iron Fist tournament, wisely using it as a distraction to seek alternative measures in order to defeat the Devil Gene. As even with Jin gone, Kazuya was now in control of G Corporation. This hunt would take him out as far as Italy, recruiting the legendary exorcist Claudio. As his forces battled against Lars, Heihachi would in turn return back to his dojo, seeking peace and clairvoyance. But instead, he would be approached by an unforeseen powerful figure, the demon Akuma, who had been ordered by Kazumi to kill him. So a fight would erupt between the two, as lightning crackles and fire roars. Even with all of that fighting capability at his fingertips, the power of Akuma proves to be far too much. So Heihachi is forced to fake his death, allowing him to escape and return back to the Zaibotsu. Here, Heihachi had the perfect window of opportunity to destroy both Kazuya and Akuma. As they fought, he would take this time to reveal to the media Kazuya's true devil form, tarnishing his name and image before then hitting them both with an orbital strike. Heihachi had won, or at least so he had fought. Kazuya had not only survived, but was furious of his father's deception. To sully both of their names, Kazuya would strike down his satellite, causing the Zaibotsu name to be tarnished. Tired of these games, Heihachi would meet his son for one final battle, one that would take place in the mouth of a volcano. And this fight is incredibly back and forth, with the old man keeping up to pace with Kazuya's devil form. Blow after blow is dealt until they are both exhausted. It becomes a battle of endurance, which only ends by Kazuya's hand. By remembering every terrible second, every terrible moment he endured at Heihachi's hand. He would deal one final strike, marking the true canonical end of Heihachi Mishima. Yet wise of Heihachi's survival capabilities, Kazuya would drop him into the volcano, ending the cycle and marking the true definitive end of Heihachi. And I mean, what more really needs to be said of him here? Heihachi is such a legendary character of the franchise, but honestly, no words I could say here could really do him justice. As he's done just so much for the series, his brutality paved forth a legacy of fighters that would go on to become the face of the franchise, 
or at the very least, fan beloved favorites. And if you really think about it, all of this started from him dropping Kazuya off a cliff. It's mad and insane to see where we are now. So with that said, and us at the end of Heihachi's tale, please down in the comments below, tell me what was your favorite moment with this character, and who of his kin are you the biggest fan of? Because, well, this man has 18 to 25 kids, so there's plenty to pick from. But for now, everyone, that has been it for me. So as always, stay strong, stay well, and keep on fighting. I'll catch you in the next one.